Hey everyone, I'm Megan Kelly. Welcome to the Megan Kelly Show. Oh, look, it's Christmas inside the studio. So excited about my fake trees with their sparkly white lights. Uh, yeah, we're, we're getting ready for the holiday spirit. I mean, it's time. It's past Thanksgiving. It's time. This is the time of year where I incessantly play Christmas carols all over Sirius XM. You can find them on many channels. And two out of my three children roll their eyes saying, enough, enough. And I say, it's never enough, never we will have them on 24-7 all the way through the end of the 25th. Maybe you're like me. Uh, in the news today, President Biden has some new spin about the economy and Bidenomics. Why doesn't he stop with this? <laughs> stop. It's truly the definition of insanity. Stop it. It's not working. They hate it. It's your worst issue. You're going to have to find something else. He's got a year, but it, he needs to do something else. Uh, his latest claim is that this year's Thanksgiving was one of the cheapest on record. Really? No, not really. And we'll get into some fact checking on that. <clears throat> this is we learn more about how the Israel Hamas war has caused a war inside the White House. Wait until you hear how they're trying to appease the little snow snowflakes in there who don't like the president's messaging on Israel. Plus, we're a week away now from the next GOP debate, co moderated by yours truly. Where do things stand with Nikki Haley and Ron DeSantis competing to be? the chief alternative to Donald Trump, competing to draw the inside straight and take over as front runner past Donald Trump. Joining me here to discuss it all and much, much more, our friends from the fifth column, Camille Foster, Michael Moynihan, and Matt Welsh. You can find all of their content on Substack at wethefifth.substack.com. Hey, subscribe to the show on YouTube and follow me on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. I want to tell you about C60 Power. If you have not heard of Carbon 60 before, it's also known as C60. C60 Power says C60 is a powerful, naturally occurring, Nobel Prize winning antioxidant that works at the cellular level. And they say C60 is several hundred times stronger than conventional antioxidants like vitamin C. Now, as you can imagine, not all producers of C60 are created equally. It's very important to go for high quality, 99.99% pure C60, and don't accept any cheap knockoffs that are loaded with low quality C60 or made with unhealthy oils. C60 Power says their customers report an increase in energy and mental clarity within 30 days of daily use. If you feel like you're slowing down, could benefit from more energy and mental clarity, and you're ready to kick brain fog to the curb, try checking out shopc60.com and use the code MEGAN15 for 15% off your first order. That's shopc60.com, promo code MEGAN15, or just click the link in the description to check out shopc60.com. Guys, welcome back. Thank you for having, having us. Having us yeah. Merry Christmas. Good Megan. to see you. Yes, thank you. Thank you. I'm in the spirit. It's exciting. Makes me feel, just see my house. I November. Got like, <laughs> What do you mean? It's practically December. Everything post Thanksgiving <laughs> is cool. Even I don't go pre Thanksgiving usually, though I did this year. Okay. Anyway, it's a long story. Um, I think the most interesting thing happening right now is Nikki Haley appears to be coalescing support as the non Trump alternative. And uh, it really is one of those things where it's like, boy, you want to break late in these contests. And that's what she's doing. Um, she, there's just a report out today that the Koch brothers and their influential network is backing Nikki Haley. It's the first time they've ever backed, uh, a GOP primary contestant <clears throat> and they've chosen her. They say the election's too important to sit this one out. They've already been running ads that are anti-Trump in various swing states, just trying to get the message out. It can't be him. I'll give you a sample of some of that. Here's just a bit. Saw 21. Ask yourself, is it worth the risk? America is struggling because of Joe Biden's policies. But with Donald Trump, Republicans lost the House, lost the White House and the Senate. And we've lost our chance to capitalize on Biden's devastating record. If Donald Trump is the GOP nominee, we could lose everything. The House, the Senate, the White House. It's time to look to a new leader, unless we're willing to risk it all. But they didn't say who that new leader was. <laughs> and the decision is sort of like, well, we'll see. 
hasn't worked out so well for people looking for a non-Trump alternative because the field remains divided. This is how he got the nomination in 1516. So now the Koch brothers, in addition to many others, uh, there's Stan Druckenmiller, a billionaire who was mentioned, I think, in a New York Times report yesterday, a couple of others who are publicly saying it's Haley for them. They're getting behind her. She's the one. So do we think this will matter in, in the big contest? What do you think, guys? I think it's a test case of uh, how much money matters in GOP primary politics. Um, it, I think it matters in the sense that you can spend a lot of money in Iowa in particular and move the needle. Most every year that someone has gone all in on Iowa and um, punched above their weight. They usually do that at the uh, expense of New Hampshire and then it becomes a bit of a problem. So Haley can use that, um, the Koch brother, because David Koch uh, left us a few years ago, um, but the Koch network, which is more important than any of that, um, can give her some money to create that separation. But I think there's a, I mean, that ad uh, seemed to me directionally correct. It is, in many ways, the best argument to make to Republican Trump voters, um, not necessarily that Trump is a crazy erratic person, which is something that I might say as a non-Republican, but that he's going to lose uh, or that he's the only one who threatens to lose running against this very, very old man who's incredibly vulnerable to the extent that RFK Jr. is polling at 15 and 20 percent in the three-way matchup. My God. Um, so that is the correct thing. The question just is, uh, can you, can they uh, have Nikki Haley elbow out Ron DeSantis ahead of time and convince, you know, the Chris Christie's the world that uh, whatever he's doing is not working. Um, and I, you know, that that gap is just too large. It's hard to imagine it having a huge impact. Uh, she just clearly has performed the best uh, of all of the non-Trumps in this in this uh, race so far. Vivek had his first little bump and then he's annoyed everybody ever since. Yes. <laughs> and uh, and she's just re run really well. And I say that if somebody yeah. disagrees with her about a bunch of stuff, but she has run a great campaign so far. So maybe she'll be, you know, in a head-to-head -head race between her and Trump, that will never happen, uh, probably, sadly. Um, she would have a puncher's chance um, in a divided field. It's going to be really hard. You know, it's I funny mean, because we talk about her, guys. Uh, we talk about her surge, and she is surging, and she's, almost giving Ron DeSantis a run for his money. Not almost, she is in Iowa mm -hmm. now. Yeah. And she looks favored to win in New Hampshire and she's a South Carolina hometowner. So, but win and, you know, possible win in New Hampshire, possible, we mean second. <laughs> we mean yeah. second. You know, Trump is 50 points ahead, 30 points ahead. Take your pick. Scores of points ahead of everyone who's running second in any of these states. So yeah, I mean, this is the the question is the the real question as I see it, and you tell me, Moynihan, is whether this can kill DeSantis. Can this kill DeSantis? Because if they want Nikki, they got to get rid of him. Yeah, I mean, DeSantis, who I think um, I thought was a very strong candidate. I mean, he's uh, particularly strong in, in Florida when you come to local governance. I think he's done a a good job, despite disagreeing with him on some things. I mean, his response to to crisis there and his response to COVID. Is fantastic, but I mean, I think people have forgotten about COVID. If COVID had a real surge again, um, mm. it would be the best thing that ever happened around DeSantis because he could mm -hmm. he could actually run on that, which is something that um, I appreciate. Nikki Haley, as you said, look, I, I mean, it's all in some ways a waste of breath because she is the best person to come in second in the Koch brother or the Koch network, which is fairly interesting, by the way, that they're supporting her shows you how much they loathe Donald Trump because she's mm -hmm. essentially a neoconservative and they're a bunch of libertarians and right. they're not necessarily fans of of Nikki Haley's uh, type policy, but they see her obviously as, as the best person to make a run at Trump, which is probably true. And again, Matt, Matt is correct. I mean, it, on a head to head matchup. Yeah. I think that'd be very, very interesting, but you know, 20, 30 points behind, you know, and he's not going to show up at the debates. I mean, it's you're you're running for second place. It doesn't make a difference to, at but all. But if you look, but I, I was actually just looking at these numbers, just looking at these numbers the other yeah. day uh, on these early state polls. And we're still in the place where even though Trump is crushing all the rest, if you add up the numbers of the rest, it's split 50-50. It's yeah, split. Mm -hmm. That's true. The Republican mm -hmm, Party yeah. is split. And so it still is true that if the party coalesces, that other 50% coalesces behind one candidate, Trump would be vulnerable, Camille. I mean, it it would not necessarily be a runaway. 
Yeah, and it's it's not impossible to imagine, um, although folks would have to exit the race pretty quickly for it to actually make a difference, I think. Um, and I don't know um, if there are already conversations happening along those lines, but I don't think Vivek or Ron are likely to drop out of the race um, mm. on their own. Um, I think Vivek kind of knows what his pro- prospects are, uh, despite what he said publicly. My suspicion is that he would very happily accept a VP nod from Donald Trump and run on that or ticket. Or any with him. cabinet nod, nod. <laughs> or perhaps any <laughs> perhaps any cabinet nod. I, I do think that he and. Um, uh, uh, Nikki Haley actually hate each other. Like it seems genuine. Uh, yeah. So it's very hard to imagine them getting together <laughs> on the same ticket. Uh, but it, but it is very interesting. I think Moynihan highlights the right thing with respect to the Kochs actually having pretty severe and profound disagreements with Nikki on policy and still being willing to make that particular choice. Um, and to what Matt was saying earlier, it's not just the test of what matters with respect to money. I mean, the the Koch network has tremendous re- resources with respect to just their campaign operation and their ground game. They have a lot of great intelligence tools that they can bring to bear. It'll be an interesting test to see if those things matter at all anymore. Um, so can can actually latching all of that on to Nikki's campaign, which has been pretty good so far, but it's just a couple of weeks ago, I think, that she wanted to ban all anonymous uh, social media posting. Yeah, um, that was not a not a great call on her part. Um, so it, it is all very interesting to watch play out, if not a little bit depressing, um, but mm. certainly makes things interesting. Here's just a a little bit of numbers for you from the CNN report on the Koch Network backing Nikki Haley. They say the effort will begin with a multi-million dollar ad campaign in support of Haley launching this week in all early states and also several Super Tuesday states, which of course that happens in March, March 4th, uh, I think. And um, while they did not disclose a budget on behalf of Haley, The network has spent hundreds of millions in previous election cycles, rivaling the financial might of the Republican National Committee, which is actually quite little right now. There was a report out today Mm -hmm. about how little the RNC has in its coffers. I think it was like 10 million. And at this time in other cycles, they had 60 million. It was just dreadful. So they're not tough to beat, but the Koch network has more money than God. I, I went down there, I interviewed Charles Koch who I really respect, I have to say, he's brilliant. And I think he's a very patriotic American um, and got a chance to sort of um, see how things operate down there. And it's just like a well-oiled machine. I mean, my God, they're responsible for so many American jobs. They have very clear, as you point out, libertarian ideals. And um, to get this guy behind you, (laughs) like it's it's an unlimited deep pocket, which could really help her with ads with organization, with even get out the vote efforts in these early states. But none of these deep pocketed billionaires was really behind Trump in 2015 and 16. And he got it anyway, thanks to his big middle finger. Yeah, it didn't matter at all. What One thing that's, uh, I think- that How much did Jeb spend? Jeb, I didn't hear Jeb. the exclamation point. Yeah. Jeb spent, I, th- I think my last estimate, he spent $40 billion yeah. to kill him and got half a delegate. I think in ways that we're not fully wrapping our brains around with this news, oh, the next it's 130 days million. Are, Steve, Steve Krakauer looked it up. 130 million. Jesus, wow. that is amazing. Jeff was high. Wow. The next ten days, I think, are the uh, are the make or break moment for Ron DeSantis, and you always hesitate to say things like this before the first caucus and whatnot. But this news that the Coke Network is coming in for Haley, which is big news. And what is uh, DeSantis doing this week? He is doing the Moynihan. Uh, which is a dance uh, <laughs> and a sexual position. No, he's arguing about his state policies on Sean Hannity. The, oh, the insanity okay. in the Hannity is uh, it's uh, DeSantis versus Gavin Newsom. It's red state versus blue state, California versus Florida, and a very huge COVID response, you know, education policy uh, compare and contrast. These are where Ron DeSantis is strong. This is why he was polling within 10 percentage points of Donald Trump in January. It's hard to remember now. Because he's just been taking a nosedive ever since. So there's this, and then there's the debate with you, Megan. And I'm looking forward to your selection of questions Mm -hmm. uh, and your approach. should be great, Mm -hmm. um, as uh, your uh, performances have always been on debates. And I'm not just saying that to butter you up. It's just true. We're already Um, on the show. You don't have to say that. (laughs) Um, No, but he's got to make a difference. He's got to come at... (laughs) He's got to come at Nikki Haley. uh, and and, and, And like remind people of why he was interesting to begin with, because he's been doing a whole lot of 
not reminding them of that, or at least um, the stuff that he thought that people would be interested in are not what is going to drive the selection in this primary campaign. I don't. I, think. I will well, say that I think the message of the Coke ad, that sort of vague message, is the right one. Primarily because it's not attacking the kind of change in the Republican Party's politics and their ideology, which is something that I think the Koch network attacks pretty vigorously behind the scenes. I think it's a very good argument. I mean, as simple as you can make it is that Donald Trump is a loser. And I mean that in a very um, sort of definitional way. Yeah. Yeah. He loses mm -hmm. elections and he's been losing them. And, you know, look, I when I was out talking to people about this and. 2021 and it was a really difficult conversation to have with people because i'd say look do you want to back this guy he lost the white house mm -hmm. i mean he's george hw bush here this is crazy he lost the white house. <laughs> and they'd be like well he didn't actually lose and so that was kind of the difficult thing was that the majority of republicans believe that correct and that's why it's hard in that for for the kind of base uh, in a primary, but just broadly, when you talk to people who are vaguely conservative, their issue with Donald Trump has gone way beyond, well, I don't like his tweets. I don't like his disposition because everyone's kind of adjusted to that. They just don't like the fact that he loses in the candidates in the midterms that were Trump candidates. Good Lord, did they lose? They didn't lose by a bit either. Herschel Walker. I mean, can't believe you remember no. these people. Mehmet Oz. What a disaster <laughs> the Republicans made for themselves. Well, what do you make of these polls, though? Because if you if you look at, you know, Trump versus Biden, we've been covering this on this show for a month now. There's been a mm -hmm. rash of polling showing Trump beating Biden now, not just at the national level, which is a new thing. He, he did it here or there uh, six months ago, but it wasn't a steady thing at all. Biden was beating him by a couple points, not by a lot, more times than not. Now it's the reverse. And not just in the national polls, which are interesting to look at, but not they don't really tell you much because we don't have a national election. We don't use the popular vote. We, what matters is the swing states. Those are, those are the ones that are going to decide the election. And now Trump's beating Biden in virtually all of them. And not just by a point, for the most part, by several points. But Camille, I look at these and I remember back in 16, those same polls telling me Hillary was going to crush Trump in every <laughs> single one of these. Right. So it's, you know, the, the polls have been so hard to read for the past eight years, but I don't know. Is there reason to doubt these polls now, given how controversial Trump is, that he hasn't yet gone through the four criminal trials, but will have, or at least be in the midst of some of them at the time we actually vote? And are these actual Trump fans who are filling up these numbers showing him beat, beating Joe Biden, or are they just kind of pissed off right now at Biden? disgusted over his age and incoherence and trying to send him the middle finger. I, I think it's impossible, impossible to put too much faith in the polls right now. There's just so much time and so much that could happen. I, I think the foreign policy questions that you alluded to um, earlier um, when you were opening the, the show up um, are hugely important and consequential and things could move in any direction there. And certainly it seems like that's a liability for Biden um, in the general, the sort of thing that could dampen enthusiasm for him um, amongst Democrats and independents. Um, but similarly, I suppose that could be an issue for uh, uh, Nikki Haley as well. Um, and Donald Trump will likely be calibrating in some sort of way that perhaps makes him a little more appealing. And as someone mentioned, um, there may be a third party spoiler this race um, as well, which could hugely complicate things. So it is very, very difficult to say what things will look like several months from now. Um, even in January uh, of next year, once we finally start um, to look at these primaries taking place, it'll be very hard to predict exactly how this is going to play out. Mm hmm. The uh, New York Times is giving Nikki Haley some of its, you know, expected treatment. There's a piece out uh, today, right? Is today the 27th? No, it's the 28th. So it came out yesterday, 28th. Paul Krugman. Uh, Nikki Haley is coming for your retirement. And, oh, you know, God. most sane people understand that Social Security and Medicare are in some financial pro trouble, <laughs> one could yep. say. And um, something's going to have to be done about them. And the Democrats just want to keep raising taxes on everybody. And the Republicans, the serious ones, are actually looking at how how to actually handle this. Do we raise the retirement age? Uh, you know, what do we do? Do we do means testing for those who are going to receive it? You know, they, there was a line of the last debate. I think it was Chris Christie saying, I certainly hope Warren Buffett is not collecting his Social Security check. Um, in any event, so this piece goes after her <clears throat> saying, I'll give you the setup. 
He points out she's receiving a late surge in big money support uh, and says, but look, you know, she, it, Trump's the odds on favorite, but there's a chance still that he could manage to crash and burn. So it seems worth looking at what Haley stands for. From a political point of view, one answer might be nothing. <laughs> and then he hits her for flip-flopping, uh, which he says doesn't really convey the sheer cynicism with which she has shifted her rhetoric. I mean, that's not entirely wrong, but it's like, okay, find me a politician who hasn't done it, but okay, that's fine. Um, then they say the one thing that she's been, he says, that she's been pretty consistent on is economics and fiscal policy. And on this issue, she's an extremist. She's calling for an increase in age at which Americans become eligible for Social Security, a bad idea that seems to be experiencing a revival, and then goes on to say, Social Security is fine. It's fine. The actual numbers don't justify the apocalyptic rhetoric that we're hearing. Like, we're going to be good. And by the way, if we're not good, we're just going to tax people. That's the way forward. And continues to rip on her policies about you know, suggesting that you can't tie, um, you can't tie life expectancy into this. This is something Ron DeSantis hit her on too, because the people, while, while richer Americans are living longer, poorer Americans aren't. So he's basically saying she hates the poor. If you want to tie social security benefits to life expectancy and raise the retirement age from 65 to 70, uh, like she's suggested, you're going to hurt the poor because the poor don't live longer, like all the rich people. Anyway, this is what's going to happen now that she's emerged as the, the latest darling, right, of the GOP. You're going to get more and more hit pieces on her. And you know what? That stuff works. It tends to drive your poll numbers down. So what do you make of the early shots? I mean, it's pretty uh, it's pretty limp stuff, honestly. Like uh, Democrats and the media, and I'm sorry to be redundant, um, uh, back in January, February, there was a rash of DeSantis is actually worse than Trump, right? Because this is the car that they have, right? It's supposed to be about the stakes and not the odds. Stakes of this election are that we'll never have democracy again. And it's over. Right, it's over, et cetera. And so Trump is this clarifying thing for this crowd of uh, scaring them with Trump is the way to, to get Democratic turnout. So they had worked themselves up into a Ron DeSantis is actually worse because he's smart, because he's Harvard, Yale, because he knows what he's doing and he's not just a bumbling idiot. And he can actually like have uh, a point really good people and it's really going to be evil and bad. Um, it's not really uh, working that well so far for Paul Krugman. I, I get that he's threatening me with a good time on Social Security stuff. <laughs> um, I presume that the uh, his his lack of interest in actuarial tables must apply to himself since um, beginning, what, in 10 years, less than 10 years now, we're uh, scheduled to have an across the board haircut of all Social Security recipients if we don't change things. Mm -hmm. um, to put it uh, gently. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, it's like 20 percent, I think. Um, and uh, so maybe he thinks he's going to be. Uh, uh, out in the little pasture in the in the sky or something by then. It's not going to concern him in any way. Um, this is old timey. Uh, we're going to scare um, uh, people into line. You saw the, a similar thing happen before the midterm elections. There were two lines of attack. One is that um, these are Trump people and MAGA is terrible. And that uh, kind of worked. And they had, as Moynihan was alluding to before, a lot of characters that they could run against showing that. Um, there was that. And then there was this weird thing of like, uh, watch out for Ultra MAGA. Ultra MAGA <laughs> is actually out here trying to sunset Social Security in five years. Go back and look at it. I know it uh, sounds crazy, but that was where the rhetoric was at just 12 months ago. And it was nonsense. It was all based on Rick Scott having one report, one sentence in one report of a white paper that nobody otherwise read like 11 years ago said X. And so somehow we're going to sunset Social S uh, Security. Um, the fact is, and you are right, uh, Megan, is that grownups... Um, including the Simpsons Bowles Commission that was a bipartisan organization of the Simpson and Bowles, not in the same party. Yeah. The whole thing, uh, uh, you know, approved by 11 of the 18 people on that commission and mentioned in 17 consecutive State of the Union addresses that you can't just keep kicking the can down the road, as Barack Obama himself said as he went into office. Um, that was a normal Democratic position. And I dare say it was a normal Paul Krugman position back when he occasionally pretended to be a sane economist. Um, if this is the worst they can come up with Nikki Haley, 
I don't think it's going to stick. And I think they're going to move on to that. She is a knuckle dragging warmonger, uh, which, you know, there'll be more evidence for. I mean, the thing about Krugman is he he is in some sense, when it comes to Social Security, endorsing Donald Trump. Yes. Donald Trump has said mm -hmm. the same thing. Donald mm -hmm. Trump has run mm -hmm. against Ron DeSantis on this issue. And, you know, it's one of the reasons that, that Trump makes my skin crawl a little bit because he knows that, I mean, remember, and I bring this up quite a bit, that when his version of health care came back to the White House from Republicans when they were trying to overturn Obamacare, his response was, it's too mean. <laughs> what, look at what he said. It's too mean. He is a man who likes government. He likes government spending. And uh -huh. he has defended Social Security and said, Ron DeSantis, all you old people should come out and vote for me because Ron DeSantis is, is going to take away your Social Security. Now, Paul Krugman is not somebody that one can really trust him on a lot of things. I mean, recall that quote of his when he said the Internet is not going to be a big thing. Do you remember yeah. that? Yeah. He was like, oh that, like gosh, the fax machine. Right. It'll go away. But he won. He won a, a Nobel Prize. Yeah, I think all of these attacks. <laughs> um don't make any sense and don't resonate with people when you I, I mean look republicans have been getting voters in that age cohort for many years saying we are not going to take away your money we are but it's going to bankrupt itself this is a very very easy thing for people to understand and i don't think you know running in that direction against nikki haley is is going to make make much of a difference and also I know, and Krigman especially you hear the candidates <laughs> They say over and over, even those who are talking about raising the retirement age, not for the current retirees, not even for people Correct. who are now in their 40s. They're talking about for people mm -hmm. who are in their 20s or 30s. That's at least what they're saying on paper and openly that that those are the only people they would do this to. So you'd have a long runway to understand you have to work five more years before you can get your Social Security. But they treat it like it's a wipeout, like it's they were going to take out the eraser and the accounts are gone. I've got to pivot to this because you mentioned the old quote. Um about uh, uh, from from Krugman, and it that I've got to get this in. I wasn't sure where we'd get to it, but Secretary of Education Miguel Cardona. Oh, you guys, this is I know That's you've amazing. seen it. I don't know if the audience has heard yeah. it, but he was giving testimony um, and was trying to discuss his department's priorities and workforce development efforts, and during this governor's association's meeting. And he was talking about, you know, what the government has done and so on and tried to quote Ronald Reagan. But as all of you know, and as the audience is about to hear, didn't quite understand that there was more to the quote. Listen. You know, we're going to set up follow up calls with every governor we met with to make sure we're available. Um, as uh, I think it was President Reagan said, we're from the government. We're here to help. No, <laughs> he doesn't even know. He's, he did. He, thinks he did Reagan. say that. He did, but so, there was another clause in that sentence. That's which we him. have, which we yes. have. Here it is. Here's the, the real Ronald Reagan yes. soundbite. I think you all know that I've always felt the nine most terrifying words in the English language are, I'm from the government and I'm here to help. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Unbelievable. Oh my God. That is great. This was the story of the day. Like, I'm, not, I'm pretty sure it was Ronald yeah. Reagan. A big fan of big government. Who said this? It's like he also looks like he should be a high school principal. Is that yeah. am I wrong in thinking that? In the box. No. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I do. But somebody was I saying online. I think it was uh, Dave Marcus, he, Camille. He was saying, imagine having so little connection to half the country, conservative America, <laughs> that you are not familiar with that yeah. quote, which is absolutely famous. I mean, across parties, it's famous. But if you're a Republican, if you're ever voted Republican or Libertarian, oh yeah, you love this quote for a reason. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that has the, exactly the opposite um, of of what you were hoping uh, that the intended uh, impact would be. Um, but I do feel obliged, and I, I hate that I'm forced to do it to qualify mm -hmm. something. The Krugman, the Krugman quote. He was oh, no. responding to a prompt in which he was invited to offer uh, an opinion that was wrong. likely to, to be wrong. <laughs> it was it was something along those what? lines. Yeah, it what was like a weird- What kind of weirdly BS it was, is that? It was, I'm That's, just saying, I don't want right, to defend the guy, right. but he, he right. knew that it was likely to be wrong. Well, I, now that you, you've beaten down <laughs> your colleagues, I will build them back up by telling you that Miguel Cardona was a principal.
He was a principal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. No, no, he should have stayed there. Um, because I know that that if you wanted, I could be like, you know, here's a quote from Hitler. And it's like, yeah, but you left. It sounds philo-Semitic, but the next clause is about the bad things that are about to happen. You with anyone. I don't know. what He's a principal of the worst school in New York, right? Tell me the ranking of that school. Do you have it in front of you, Megan? I'm sure you do. It can't be worse than old Hillcrest, which is in the news. We talked oh, about Hillcrest. them yesterday oh, with their gosh. hundreds of students. Yeah. Students mobbing the poor Jewish teacher who showed up at a rally yeah. saying, what did she say? Was it horrible? Was it kill all the Palestinians? Was it I hate Palestinian children? It was, I stand with Israel. Kill, with kill, Israel. get her, yeah. get yeah. her. Yeah. Nice. Uh, that that the, school uh, is 540 out of New York's 571. And this is the shit they're worrying about. Is that right? Always. Wow. Oh my God, I'm so proud of them for moving up 20 spaces. <laughs> the the uh, chancellor of uh, the New York City school system yesterday, David Banks, had just an appalling press conference and Twitter thread about this, um, saying, uh, among other things, that uh, uh, what's really needed right now is a uh, uh, de-escalation, and we have uh, we have a ceasefire. We have shared our <laughs> words about uh, tolerance. It's like, dude. And he also he also described the 400 students that were rioting as just a fraction of the population. <laughs> <laughs> Which, as I pointed out before, the fraction was nine tenths. Right? <laughs> right. There are 500 uh, students. A fraction. <laughs> it is a fraction. No, it shows like uh, uh, and and Megan, I know that you know uh, the New York City school system uh, more than you would like to, as I do as well. And uh, it just shows what a, a rot uh, this was. You know, like. October 7th was a margin call on a lot of different things. It sort of showed things about our society and our schools and everything else um, and our institutions that maybe we didn't really want to know. And one of them is that they've lost control of the schools. Like they're 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 using, uh, you know, uh, various sort of de-escalation techniques rather than, oh, if you beat up the cop, you're expelled. Yeah. <laughs> just, it's very <laughs> hard just to expel the student or just, you know, the, you have to go away for a while, student. Um, I, Maybe and, to jail? Um, that's, that's a good place to put people when they beat up cops. Yeah. Try not to throw everybody in jail. <laughs> but no, there has to be uh, repercussions from it. And this is true, not just of students, but it's true of protesters who are absolutely screwing up all of New York City as we speak. They're just like, oh, there's a Macy's parade. Let's cement or glue ourselves to the cement in the parade. <laughs> I was driving home from uh, from uh, a very nice holiday weekend and traffic was great and it was awesome. And I was turning to go on the Manhattan Bridge and suddenly I was stuck in 45 minutes of traffic. You're without in Gaza. Being... <laughs> and there's these five little snot nosed kids wearing yellow vests. Uh, and kind of like dancing around, they looked like they could be knocked over with a feather and they had yellow taped themselves into front of the entrance that I was supposed to go in. And there was oh. a, a van full of cops and a phalanx of cops everywhere. Just like, all right, you know, five losers can shut down the Manhattan Bridge on the busiest travel day of the year. Yeah. Can I say something that's really awful? I'm going to say something that's awful. Yeah. I'm just yeah. going to say something. It, it was, I going to admit something that was on our text chain. The, the three of us have a text chain. It's in, private for a reason. It's private for a reason because it's really <laughs> appalling. Um, and the one, when they glued themselves to the ground at the Thanksgiving Day Parade, the Macy's Day Parade, I said um, to Matt and Camille, the, if they're gluing their hands to the ground, why don't we just go and pepper spray them? Because they can't cover their eyes <laughs> and just keep pepper spraying them until they say, okay, get the... Get the like the the solution to get the, the rubber of cement off of me, and just keep pepper spraying them. And guess what? They're not going to do it again because yeah. I'm going to be there every time you you tape yourself to something. I'm going to spray you in the eyes with bear spray. Do you know how many people they are? I'm going to. Do you know how many people they arrested for shutting down the Manhattan Bridge for three hours? On the Zero. Point? Three. Oh wow! They arrested Oof. three people. Our our pal oh, Nancy Roman, who lives a, a block away, went down there. And she asked a cop, why aren't you arresting people? They are literally blocking the bridge. And said, but not our call. Not our call. So Chris Christie it? did this and it, and it cost him his presidential hopes. How are these people right? getting away with the slap mm. on the taped wrist? Correct. If I'm not mistaken, Eric Adams won the, the election to be the mayor of New York City as a backlash candidate for perceived disorder, particularly as it were, uh, pertains to law and order. The dude's a cop, mm -hmm. right? They, they elected a cop to maybe, I don't know, enforce the law or increase the enforcement of the law at a time when there's been absolutely noticeable slippage all around you. 
And now you're letting these snot nosed kids um, who don't know anything when you ask them a single question about like stop the occupation in Gaza. Um, if you ask them about what was happening on October 6th, just blank faces, they don't get it. Um, and they're going to shut down. They're going to they're, they're having a protest in front of the Christmas tree lighting in Rockefeller yes, Center yeah. tomorrow. Yeah. Um, they're calling it the uh, tree lighting flood. Yes, which is a Incredible. reference to That's al disturbing. flood, which was the name That's of disturbing. the Hamas operation which to kill civilians. Which they've been doing right, before. The they've been calling their, you know, the White House flood to this flood. It has certainly been pointed out to them that the word flood. Oh, um, they know what they're doing. Uh, they know what they're doing. Yeah. We're going to do a flood at the Christmas tree lighting. It's an advertisement for, hey, look, if you're a parent and you live in New York, God, you're stupid. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, you would normally want to maybe take your kid to the Macy's parade, take your kid to the tree lighting. Well, maybe if they're going to do an Alaska flood at the tree lighting, I'm not going to be so enthusiastic. Did, about hey, going no. hey, Matt, did you hear my plan about pepper spraying people? <laughs> <laughs> I have to say, you got my vote. By the way, speaking I of traffic situations that, that can't that can't use, they cannot handle any more problems. The Christmas tree lighting at Rockefeller Center is one of them. My God, if you mm, yeah. know anything about this, you know to stay the hell home that night. Do not go yes. into New York. Do not get anywhere near Rockefeller Center. It's not worth it. You can see the tree at any point thereafter. Just seeing the little bulbs <laughs> go on is not such a, such a big yeah. thrill. It's, it's not worth yeah, it. it, it It'll, Yes. I do want to clarify something that um, if people were gluing themselves to the street to lower taxes, <laughs> I would still pepper spray them. Yeah. And I want lower, lower taxes. taxes. No, this is I, true. I don't like people this disrupting yes. my life. And there's enough of them in New York right now. I don't need yeah. more. So, I don't need to sit in traffic I'm, any longer. I'm bipartisan in my pepper spraying. Just I right. also have to say, like, I, I if you're really going to, if you really want me to take you seriously, glue something more important to the street. Oh, 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 you know something that you really care about quickly. Yeah, yeah i'm just saying go down south in rio or i'd even take a face put your face yeah. there <laughs> face I, might, or don't. Oh I don't God. know <laughs> raise the stakes <laughs> then your pepper spray it's plan would really work my hand if they, their faces yeah. were done oh yeah that would that probably be probably pretty painful <laughs> I don't know. I think I've We're earned my way under the text chain. Right? We can yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. I'll screenshot and oh. send you the best. Yeah. So speaking of weird partners for the fifth column, um, you're uh -oh. not going to believe what happened today on our own text chain on the MK show. So we, of course, knew that you were coming on. Let me see if I can find this. And I don't know. Steve Krakauer, our executive producer, sends a note to all of us. We always exchange like, this is in the news. Do we like it? This is in whatever. And yeah. this is the text he sent all of us. <laughs> oh, it's no. so funny now. Chris Cuomo has a big announcement today. Oh, God. He's joining the fifth column on Substack. It's <laughs> not true. This is fake news, Crack yeah. Hour. No, is, he, is, he, is he coming on? Is that true? No. Look at my hands. He's coming on. He is. Who invited so, him? Do we, do you, did you invite no. him? Can he wear I mean, the baseball he, uniform? Go ahead. He's, Shirtless he's, only. Um, then he's Substack joining. Out, he can come on. He's joining Substack. And he was, yeah. Yeah, Steve was trying he to is. say, just like our I pals. See. Okay, yes. but it, we were all so confused. And the reactions from everybody are hilarious. <laughs> Mine was, what? OMG, what are they thinking? <laughs> right. anyway, oh, really? Meaning, meaning you guys. Are you would be well, listen, to that? Like I'm going to give you his announcement about it, and you tell me how you okay. feel about him possibly <laughs> right. even joining you guys on Substack. Here right. it is. I then yeah, realize okay. that why aren't I giving the people that I care about in the project the same option? Yeah. Ah, yeah. So that's where Substack comes in. <laughs> there are big realities that we all deal with. And I am not afraid of those realities. Um, struggle is real. It is the human condition. Oh I am old what enough, the fuck is he talking about? damaged enough, uh, and okay <laughs> enough to say I really <laughs> am not great at life. I struggle a what? lot with things. What? I get things wrong. He's repeatedly. trying not to laugh. And that takes us to the biggest aperture of life is your own mind. And I remember being fascinated early on in my love of hip hop, which then was just called rap. 
What? <laughs> Hold on, what? Wait, 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 wait. How many times, and I'm going to ask listeners this, and you don't have to acknowledge it to anybody who's in the car with you or anything, but how many times have you smoked weed with that guy in college who's like, you know, my brain and the aperture, and I'm so bad at everything, like man? To yeah. go, like, oh what? Is he talking but about? The, How, what, is it about it's, Substack? But it's the Stuart Smalley, like, daily affirmation yeah, thing exactly. that is so great. <laughs> like, I'm, I'm good enough. <laughs> yeah. What are you doing, Chris? Yeah, yeah. I make doing? mistakes. Anybody <laughs> time somebody says that, it's like, oh my god, you killed the man, didn't you? A mistake you <laughs> make is to go to the teeth whitening specialist oh, every it. day, more often than Camille yeah. goes to the barber. Do you know what's really weird? There's one of two things that happen when we come on the Megyn Kelly show. One is I have to talk the view. about um, the View, the View, uh, and Joy Behar, um, who, by the way, had a conversation with people the other day. People you thought were Jewish who aren't. Joy Behar, um, oh, oh, uh, yeah, and, oh, and, and Weird Al oh. Yankovic, another one. Um, oh. <laughs> this is a conversation with a Jewish friend, by the way. Um, but it's either that or Chris Cuomo. And <laughs> I think it was like you heard him playing, somebody was playing Chris Cuomo in their car really loud, or he was? Oh, yeah. Yes. Right. Was, I, I remember. <laughs> no, he <laughs> said that. He said oh, that yeah. he pulled up to oh, a red right. light and the guy yeah. next yeah. to him I think in a convertible Crankish. was playing Crankish. the Chris Cuomo, Cuomo pla- podcast yeah. <laughs> like at max level. Like, yo, yeah. hey, big yeah. fan. Yeah. Yeah. Nobody's like, yo, done me. that ever. Yeah. <laughs> never, never. Yeah. Never ever happened. I, I'm not uh, sure he knows what hip hop music is. I mean, I to be totally so, no. honest, I've never heard him talk about this at any other point. This is my love of hip hop. Really? Really, Chris? <laughs> can we send him album? back into his basement in East Hampton? <laughs> can we, do, he's been can we shoot from the basement? Well, yeah. Therapized. That is the, I mean, that, <laughs> he's overly therapized. Like, get out or get a better therapist. Get one that talks oh to you gosh. the way mine does, which is very frank man. Very, very frank, which is good. It's what I really? needed. I, I've well, said before, one of his like classic he's lines. So. He, says, he said to me one time, and it was, it was perfectly suited, you know, Megan, you don't always have to take the path of most resistance. <laughs> oh, wow. wow. Now you tell me. <laughs> and he's British too? <laughs> he is South African originally. He's South African. Oh. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay. <laughs> so he's got like just the lovely little, like a little hint of an little accent lead. left. Yeah, just, a yeah, just, just a little bit. Yeah, like you're, you're like British, just enough to make him sort of sound smarter than everybody else. All right, stand by. <laughs> That's how these guys stand, sound too. At least two out of three. I'll let you figure out which two. <laughs> They'll be back right after this quick break. The holiday season is upon us and I've got something special for you a gift that will keep you comfortable and stylish all year round. Introducing Gravity Defier Shoes, designed to make every step feel like you're walking on air. From casual sneakers to elegant dress shoes to slip-resistant shoes for the outdoorsy type, Gravity Defier has a style for every occasion. And with their patented VersoShock technology, these shoes provide superior shock absorption, reducing impact on your joints, and keeping you comfortable all day long. Your feet are going to thank you. Gravity Defier shoes are not only comfy, but stylish. They have a huge range of designs. With the snowy holidays around the corner, these make the perfect gift for your loved ones or even yourself. Don't miss out on this exclusive offer. Use code MK30 at checkout to get 30 bucks off your orders of $150 or more. That's at gdefy.com, G-D-E-F-Y.com. Visit gdefy.com, use code MK30, for $30 off orders of 150 or more. Okay, guys, so um, this is a short block, so we want to get to a, a, a good story that won't take 30 minutes, and I think we found it in the dead spin attack, attempt to ruin the life of a young boy who wore to a football game starring the Kansas City Chiefs um, half of his face black, half of his face red, and with a Native American like headdress on. And the Deadspin writer, Karen, C-A-R-R-O-N-J Phillips, described as a black male senior writer for Deadspin, lost his ever-loving mind on this kid and on the NFL. Just a couple of samples, because all Karen saw in the original picture was the black half of the kid's painted face um, and went off. It takes a lot to disrespect two groups of people at once. But on Sunday afternoon in Las Vegas, a Kansas City Chiefs fan 
neglecting to point out at this point so far that it's a young child, found a way to hate black people and the Native Americans at the same time. The images of a Chiefs fan in blackface wearing a Native headdress during a road game leads to so many unanswered questions. Why did the camera person give this fan the attention? Where are we mentioning that it's a child? Nowhere yet. Why did the producer allow that camera angle to be aired at all? And then we get to it. Is that fan a kid slash teenager or a young adult? Despite their age, who taught that person what they were wearing was appropriate? The answers to all these questions lead back to the NFL. While it isn't the league's responsibility to stop racism and hate from being taught in the home, they're a league that has relentlessly participated in prejudice. If the NFL had outlawed the chop at Chiefs games and had been more aggressive in changing the team's name, then we would not be here. There is no place for a franchise to be called the Chiefs in a league that's already eradicated Redskins. This is what happens when you ban books, stand against critical race theory, and try to erase centuries of hate. You give future generations the ammo they need to evolve and recreate racism better (laughs) than before. And by the way, I don't know how this fits in, but he adds, it's also cruel to expect the oppressed to assist their oppressors in the termination of their own oppression. So when it came out- so tired. I know, it's it's exhausting. (laughs) When it came out that it was a kid wearing, I don't, the Chiefs colors are red and yellow, I think. I'm not sure how the black plays in, but half black, half red face, like we see at a lot of these sporting events. Half black, whatever, half black, half red. Um, He doubled down. For the idiots in my mentions who are treating this as some harmless act because the other side of his face was painted red, I could make the argument that that makes it even worse Y'all are the ones who hate Mexicans, but wear sombreros on Cinco. So what? (laughs) What? What? This is go away. Can you reread the sombreros thing slowly? Y'all, okay. Y'all are the ones who hate Mexicans, but wear sombreros on Cinco. I don't know how that. What is that? Is it I'll have you know yeah, that Camille yeah. Foster wore a sombrero on Cinco de Mayo <laughs> on air on the I Fox did. Business nice. Network. That's true. While Good for you. had Good drinking for you. on Yeah. On, on I think air. I was actually yeah. eating guacamole, if, if I'm yeah. not mistaken. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Did all of those Throwing things. a taco, you're yeah. good to go. Margarita. Yeah. Um, I know. So, I, I, what are they? I what about the say, attempt to ruin this young boy's life and blame it all on the NFL, too? Oh, it's let's do more. Let's do more ruining of kids' lives because after Covington, we just haven't had enough uh, <laughs> recently. Um, I do want to say that as uh, somebody, Megan, you can sympathize uh, with this, who has had to experience this for a very long time as an Irish American and having to see uh, the Notre Dame <laughs> fighting Irish mm-hmm. make our people look like drunken street brawlers <laughs> that we definitely are not, nope. and which I've never seen an Irish person get into a fight. They're usually doing never. mathematics or <laughs> winning <laughs> Nobel Prizes and not Spelling definitely these. not getting wasted and fighting people. But I think as <laughs> an Irish American who has gone through this to the football team with a picture, or actually I'm from Boston, the Boston Celtics, is an Irishman with a pipe in his mouth and his fists up ready to fight. Oh. That's the well, that's every time you pick up a, a box of lucky yeah. charms that those wounds don't heal. That's a box of racism. Megan. <laughs> and if you want to eat racism for breakfast, I'm sure you're feeding it to your kids to make them racist <laughs> against their own people. You know, my culture is not Megan Kelly's costume. OK, and I think you should show that. These fucking people, unbelievable. I can't even, I like it's, do you know you get those stories where you don't even know what to say anymore? You're like, I just yes. can't even believe they're real. No, it's outrageous, but you know this kid's this. life is ruined right now. You know this kid, he's, he's a real kid, he's going to school and you know his teachers are looking at him and his classmates are like, oh, oh, you know, and the kid's like, oh my God, I'm all over the papers. This is racist. I hate so many people. I hate blacks and I hate Native Americans, I guess. And that somehow some breweries on Cinco <laughs> come into it. Well, maybe, it's, maybe it's not ruined. <laughs> Uh, uh, maybe the silver lining in this is that it's dead spin, and who knew the dead spin is still alive? Uh, and if you're still alive, and if you even call that alive, that terrible, terrible writing, uh, maybe we've moved on from that, uh, Camille. Uh, maybe we finally we're taking the Camillist route of this, and he says that as a Redskins hater from way back, but not necessarily the name. But like it, it is so transparently stupid. If you ask an average normal American of whether this kid should be crucified, they'd be like, what are you even talking about? Mm-hmm. And when is Deadspin really going to go bankrupt this time? Yeah. Mm-hmm. I think that's okay, we lost Camille's feed for right now. We'll get it back in the commercial break. But yeah, um, the, the this is the same guy, by the way, this writer, Karen, C-A-R-R-O-N, um, a th- courtesy of Lives of TikTok that unearthed this t- old 2016 tweet. 
This is what he tweeted on March 6th of 16. I'm from Saginaw, spent a lot of time in Flint. This is Michigan, of course. I've never seen this many white people in Flint in my life. It's concerning. Okay, it's concerned. What? So he's concerned about all the whites he saw in Flint, Michigan. Um, and he is because he Karen, really cares about he? racial sensitivity, I guess. I don't, I'm not really <laughs> totally following Camille. He's back. But what do you make know. of Karen? I, I have no idea what to make of someone who is is disconcerted when they see people of a different race in their in their general vicinity. I, I think we used to have a word for that sort of thing, maybe mm -hmm. racist. Um, yeah. <laughs> I think it probably applies here. I don't like I don't like seeing people who don't look like me in my area, my general vicinity. Hey, you're a right. racist. You should do That's something so about that. <laughs> I'm telling you, I've said it before. I'm going to say it again. The Browns, only a, a matter of time. They're going to. Yes. Oh, wow. I never right? thought about that. Yeah. You know Chiefs why? Because I'm not racist. <laughs> Browns are going. How about my people? The Syracuse Orange. The Orange, they got to go. They, they try to play uh, themselves off uh, like they're a little fruit. We know what you're implying. Orange, oh. orange face. It's just a matter oh. of time you heard it here first. <laughs> Stand by, quick break. <laughs> much, much more with the fifth column, including President Trump now addressing the beating he's been taking for repeatedly referring to President Biden as President Obama will tell you the excuse he's offering and you will tell us whether you buy it. Stand by. Are you thinking about how Christmas shopping can be easier and less stressful this year? Many families are embracing experiences and family gifts rather than the frenzy of individual shopping. Well, now's the perfect time to order the ultimate family gift, a Michael Phelps Swim Spa by Master Spas. A Michael Phelps Swim Spa by Master Spas combines the benefits of both a hot tub and an exercise pool, and it can be installed in less than a day. As the chilly weather sets in and the snow begins to fall, imagine the luxury of slipping into warm, soothing waters right in the comfort or your, of your backyard. Michael Phelps Swim Spas come in a variety of sizes to complement almost any yard, even if it's a small one. And since it's heated, you can use it year round in any climate, including winter. Michael Phelps Swim Spas are 100% built in the USA by Master Spas. That's the world's largest swim spa manufacturer. Order yours today. Go to masterspas.com. Put in the promo code MK and that'll save you a thousand bucks on a Michael Phelps swim spa or 500 bucks on a Master Spas hot tub. Masterspas.com promo code MK. The Megan Kelly Show is supported by Grand Canyon University. Founded in 1949, GCU is a private Christian university that's dedicated to delivering an affordable and transformative higher education. Their vibrant campus is located in beautiful Phoenix, Arizona. And according to niche.com, ranked a top 25 best campus in the USA. As of June, 2023, GCU offers 330 academic programs with over 270 of them online, allowing you the freedom to earn your degree on your time from wherever you are. At GCU, your degree, whether it's a bachelor's, master's or doctorate, integrates the free market system and a welcoming Christian worldview. Learn more about GCU's programs, competitive tuition rates, and scholarship offers from your university counselor. They're part of the supportive graduation team that takes a personalized approach to helping you achieve your academic goals walking alongside you every step of the way. Find your purpose at Grand Canyon University. Private, Christian, affordable. For more info or to enroll, visit gcu.edu. All right, so picking back up on our politics conversation where we left some goodness on the floor, uh, regarding Trump, regarding Biden and the internal flutterings at the White House over how he's handling the Israel crisis. Um, before I get to that, I do want to do the Trump thing because we, we left off kind of with GOP politics, Nikki Haley, DeSantis, and so on. So one of the, the things that's been coming at Trump, both from Biden, I think, but definitely from Team DeSantis, has been attacks on whether he's still got it right? Whether he's also suffering from some of the same age-related deterioration that President Biden is. And one of the things that he's been doing is he continues to refer to President Biden as President Obama. And he's done it I like seven times, I think. Uh, and DeSantis has been making a thing out of this. And now Trump has responded by saying it was intentional. He's saying that it was done, quote, sarcastically, 
Hold on, I'm going to find you exactly how he defended it. Um, because this is, you know, this is a problem for him potentially, because this, if the GOP doesn't want to lose this card to play against Biden, they certainly don't want their nominee to have the same issue. Okay, let's see. Um, he insists that he was not confused. He was just being sarcastic. Quote from Truth Social. Whenever I sarcastically insert the name Obama for Biden as an indication that others may actually be having a very big influence in running our country, Ron DeSanctimonious and his failing campaign apparatus, together with the Democrats' radical left disinformation machine, go wild, saying that Trump doesn't know the name of our president. Crooked Joe Biden. He must be cognitively impaired. No, I know both names very well. I never mix them up. And I know that they are destroying our country. <laughs> then he goes on to say he just took a cognitive test and aced it. Also aced a perfect score, one taken while in the White House. Biden should take one. Ba 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 ba. Okay, so classic Trump. So let's take a look at a montage of Trump saying President Obama, where he clearly meant Biden, what he now says was sarcasm. And we did with Obama. We won an election that everyone said couldn't be won. It's almost 500 miles of wall. Even the Obama administration says it in their stats. Right, it's all coming through Iran, and Obama wants to, he doesn't want to talk about it. He doesn't want to mention, he doesn't even mention them in his statements. It's all coming through Iran. Well, you mean President Biden. Fauci so became big in the Bush administration, in the, uh, up in, it's almost the same thing. In the Biden administration. When I came here, everyone thought Bush was going to win. Yeah, they thought Bush because Bush supposedly was a military person. Great. You know what? He was a military. He got us into the uh, he got us into the Middle East. How did that work out? Hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so what do you think, yeah. jury? Sarcasm? No, <laughs> no. <laughs> Come on now. Clearly not. <laughs> no. It wasn't. Sarcasm I mean, you can tell it wasn't. Sarcasm requires a tone of voice. You have to, it, it, sarcasm requires a hint to the audience that you're uh -huh. being sarcastic. That's how sarcasm yeah. works. There's no hint there at all. And like, look, the point is, is that there's, you know, he's an old guy and this happens to everybody who's old. It's a matter of degree. And, and some I mean, of us he, who aren't. And some of us who aren't. <laughs> I've, I don't, I don't even know what show I'm on right now. And I just, I just want to thank you for having us on the Glenn Beck show. But you know, it's, it, this happens to people. The Biden one is pretty serious, though. Number one, because he's president. And number two, because it's the physical impairment, too, that kind of makes it seem so much more acute when he's like, you know, what is the the um, Shane Gillis who says he's like a Roomba vacuum he, when he tries to get <laughs> yeah. off the stage? Biden. He's just like Biden, trying yeah. to find Biden is, yeah, or, or Obama, whatever we're calling him at the moment. But mm -hmm. that's, I mean, there's the degrees here. Like, I expect him to go. For, I mean, it, it's a matter of like, I've seen the guy speak in the past, uh, uh, been there for, for a Trump rally in the past couple months, right? Three months. And I didn't see anything. He was sharp as a tack and he was funny and he was doing his bit. And you're going to screw up, and I'm sure that's age related. But you know, it's not nearly as bad as what's happening to Biden. It's just and, the fact. Yeah. And the sarcasm like wouldn't work anyway. So why would you remind people that Obama is part of of what you're running against? Sense. Obama is kind of popular. Michelle Obama is, mm -hmm. for whatever reason, is one of the most popular uh, figures in modern American life. Um, very uh, best selling author and, and whatnot. Um, even no matter how many times uh, Barack Obama posts, you know, selfies with Bruce Springsteen online, he's still popular. I don't <laughs> personally get it. Um, but uh, Biden is the one who's unpopular and he's the one who's uh, is wearing the uh, uh, both the international unquiet or disquiet and the weird economy in a way that Obama couldn't wear it. I mean, um, that's. That that is a thing that, you know, we were talking about Trump's poll numbers earlier. One of the reasons why I think that Trump is uh, is beating Biden is that he's less in the news um, in, through ne necessarily any fault of his own. Yeah, uh, but right. when you skip all the debates and when there's gigantic international news and your trials haven't started yet, uh, you're going to be a little bit less in the news. And so people forget how much they're uh, irritated by him one way or the other. It's amazing how he's been able to completely skate under the radar this time like at least when it comes to debating or having his ideas challenged. You know, he sat for an interview with me, which I really appreciated and thought was spicy, one with Kristen Welker and a couple of others. But we could actually have a presidential election in which there have been absolutely no debates with the two candidates who are running. You know, Trump could get this nomination 
And then Biden, I do not think Biden will debate Trump. I think he'll say, I'm not standing next to an insurrectionist, never mind a four times indicted potential felon or could even be a convicted felon by the time the debates roll around. That's not till August, uh, till fall, October of the election year. So, you know, it's a year away. Um, so we could actually have a presidential election in which neither one of the candidates has debated, uh, either in the primaries or in the actual general, which is not good for the country. That is not good. We should not accept that as a standard. It's such a middle finger, there's that word again, uh, to America. Okay, I wanna talk about Biden because what's happening to him politically and within his own White House on his Israel policy is interesting. Um, you know, you mentioned possible third parties. That won't be the only thing pulling votes away from Biden. This growing Palestinian constituency or supporters uh, of Palestine is getting more and more vocal. And the White House is trying to find a way to deal with them, even though Biden seems pro-Israel. And, and he's been pretty good in his comments about Israel, not uniformly, but, uh, you know, net net. So there's a deep dive in the Washington Post this week saying White House grapples with internal divisions on Israel, Gaza. Earlier this month, a group of about 20 distressed White House staffers requested a meeting with President Biden's top advisors, his White House chief of staff, his senior advisor, and his deputy national security advisor. And they sat with these whiners. They wanted to know the administration's strategy for curbing the number of civilian deaths, the message it plans to send on the conflict, and its post-war vision for the region. Now, there's no suggestion that these are people who are responsible for messaging or policy. It's just 20 distressed White House staffers who are demanding answers from the president and getting them. Um, some participants felt that these officials fell back on familiar talking points. Um, they go on to say, this story is based on interviews with 27 White House officials, senior administration officials and outside advisors. Wow. And they say that, uh, okay, the division inside the White House is to some degree between Biden's senior longtime aides and an array of younger staffers of diverse Damn. backgrounds. This is <laughs> These are the Wokies who are in there saying, protect, protect the people who look like me, irrespective of blame. Uh, then Biden met with five prominent Muslim Americans the day after he said you should be skeptical of the death toll numbers coming out of the, Ga the Gaza Health Ministry. And the next day he met with these five prominent Muslim Americans and apologized. According to the Washington Post, he said, I'm sorry, I'm disappointed in myself. I will do better. No, sir, you had it right the first time. You should not trust numbers coming out of Hamas, the group that puts babies in ovens. They are not our friend when it comes to anything. Uh, and now since Hamas has, Hamas has launched his attack, the administration officials have had regular discussions with staffers, political appointees, and outside groups to reassure them and to gauge their reaction. Uh, and we could go on. So the White House having to do still more handholding. We know it was Kamala Harris who put that line about Islamophobia in Biden's initial address on Israel. It was so out of place. It didn't make any sense. We were seeing an outbreak of anti-Semitism. That's where she, they went because of her. And this actually has serious political consequences potentially for this president in an election year. What do you guys make of what we're seeing there, the appeasement and how this unfolds over the next 12 months? I, I mean, talk about the least surprising news story. I mean, when you see unnamed congressional staffers um, signing a, a letter or petition of some sort about Israel and Gaza, when you see the ACLU being lost to a younger generation of people who don't want to stick up for civil liberties of bad people anymore and uh, has been completely taken over by, you know, a totally different agenda. I mean, you know, Barry Weiss, uh, my friend and the, a very close friend of the Fifth Column podcast, you know, was like ridiculed at the New York Times for saying that there is a a division, a fissure that is open between young, the younger staffers and the older staffers. And that was considered to be some sort of sacrilegious thing to say. And something mm -hmm. that wasn't true. It clearly was true. And we've seen this over and over again. I mean, that kind of thing is, is unsurprising. The best way of handling that is to ignore it. They have, what, what are they going to do? Going to go public 
and you know put the Biden administration as always having already having a very tough time with its poll numbers on this policy in even worse position. I mean, I can't imagine they would. The best thing to do is 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 to ignore people like this. The comments that Biden made to the five Muslim leaders about the death toll figures is is very distressing. Um, you know, you have to stand up and you would hope that these Muslim leaders um, would also themselves not trust and not want to be associated with Hamas and not think that they're an honest brokers. I imagine well, one would hope that that was the case. But I want to remind everybody of something, something that has really been forgotten about, because we do actually have a test case about these numbers, right? I mean, it's 10,000, 11,000, 12,000. Mm -hmm. The numbers are going to be high because it's war and it's deeply, deeply unfortunate. And I cannot stand seeing those images myself. Um, but let's remember the Israeli rocket attack on the hospital that turned out not to be an Israeli rocket attack on the hospital. Um, recall that the Gaza Health Ministry immediately said that 300 people died. And European intelligence 500. said, well, Five, I think yeah, they said 500, 500. 500 mm -hmm. went down to 300, mm -hmm. <laughs> trying to become a little more realistic. And 500 initially, and then, and then you know, people in various European intelligence said, uh, well, it, it it wasn't. It was a uh, misfired Islamic Jihad rocket. And the numbers could be anywhere from five to six to maybe 30. So we have an, we have an example of them inflating, I mean, you know, 20, 30, 50x. Uh, on one thing that turns out we find out isn't true. It's hard to find out that these things aren't true. Um, it's very rarely are you provided an opportunity like that to see them lying in action. And they have very precise numbers very quickly. Um, the Israelis took them about what they're still counting uh, the number of people who died on October 7th. They tell you 300 in 72, some exact number. Of and they'll, and they'll adjust. Died. They really will adjust downward on the Israeli side. Like they said 1,400. They already killed, have. Mm -hmm. And then they, they came out and said it was actually 1,200. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. They 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 understand that it, their reputation, their international reputation, is one that is savaged more than any other country. I mean, Bashar al-Assad doesn't get you know these things in front of the United Nations condemning them as much as Israel does. It's they, they hold the record every year, so they know they have to be careful about this stuff. So saying that the Gaza Health Ministry is untrustworthy, not even saying that those numbers are totally wrong saying that one has to be skeptical of this in the fact that people are being, you know, uh, shown into the White House to tongue lash the president for saying something yeah. that is transparently true is a bit troubling to me. And dozens uh, of your staffers, dozens of your staffers giving comment on an article like this, making it clear that you are saying things publicly that you yeah. are then disparaging in private. I and mean, this is not a good look for the Biden administration. It, it suggests that the entirety of this administration is kind of in disarray. Um, and one can only expect things to get substantially worse for them um, where this conflict is concerned, but likely in other areas as well. The reality Camille, is just that, to add uh, to that. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead, Matt. Now, just that the median position that a uh, kind of public service facing young Democratic person, especially if they're going to be focusing on uh, 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 international relations, their median position is going to be kind of the root of the problem in most of international relations and certainly the Muslim world is uh, Israel's occupation of the West Bank and the failure of the resolution of the Israeli Palestinian conflict. It's a huge generational uh, strong belief. And then there's just an American wide uh, societal and very distressing belief that I'm sure you've talked about in this program, the Harvard Harris poll that came out that something close to 50% of 18 to 24 year olds yeah. said that Hamas uh, was at least somewhat justified in using violence on October 7th. Um, that's insane. Uh, I I don't want to believe that it's true, and so it, maybe it's a little bit lessened. But it is a political reality of of uh, the Democratic coalition. Absolutely, uh, going forward, my uh, you know question for them is: Will they suddenly think that? Well, therefore, I must vote for Donald Trump or the Republican Party. Like, what do you think is going to be different here? But I'm not really sure they're thinking more than one or, or two steps ahead, yeah. or stay at home. Um, yeah. mm -hmm. uh, it's that's so what they're he's saying. Dealing that's in this article, Joe they Biden say um, that one of the Palestinian uh, Americans in one of the meetings with the White House aides said the participants left with more resolve than ever to organize their communities not to vote for Biden in the 2024 election. The person said Arabs and Muslims would also not vote for former President Trump. They could sit out the race. Go ahead, Matt. 
Joe, Joe Biden has always been, um, uh, I make one good metaphor a year, and one I made a few years back was that he's a rusty weather vane. Like wherever the Democratic winds are blowing, he's going to kind of get there creakily. And that's part of the reason why you vote for him if you're a, a conservative Democrat, is that he's not going to go full Elizabeth Warren on you and just completely lose his mind and start like making, you know, monopoly, monopolist investigations into Subway sandwiches. But he's going to get there slowly. <laughs> if the if the Democratic base is absolutely split on this, and I think it is, um, he's going to have to try to address those concerns and it's going to be unseen. The, the, this is a thing that Democrats really have to worry about. Um, because they're worrying about it um, a little bit, but not very much because the Republican Party is such a mess. And, you know, these are the own goals that that Republicans consistently give Democrats. Uh, you know, you have young people, you have, you know, uh, Arab Americans, Muslim Americans, Palestinian Americans saying we'll stay at home and some more radical uh, young people that will stay at home. And, you know, these are people that consistently vote for Democrats. A couple of weeks ago, I spoke to Rui Teixeira and John Judas uh, John Judas is a socialist. Rui Teixeira is a Democrat, and they wrote a book called The Emerging Democratic Majority. And they've just come out with a new book trying to figure out where that went wrong, called Where Did All the Democrats Go? Um, and their answer is, you know, the Democrats, if they want to win future elections, have to move away from radical cultural politics on transgender issues, on race issues, and all these things that, you know, we talk about so much in the fifth column, and come back to normal, centrist, working class, bread and butter, kitchen table issues. Now, mm -hmm. that is a problem. Those are the people that are on the quote unquote right of the Democratic Party, the sort of blue dogs, yellow dogs of, of, of yesteryear. And imagine that if these people are going away and saying, and, and you know, Tashara and Judas have a lot of poll numbers suggesting that's true. Now you're going to have people on the left of the party saying, we don't like what you're doing in vis-a-vis -vis, um, Israel and Palestine. So where is this? I mean, this party is going to fracture in a thousand different places. And this is a great opportunity for Republicans to stop their silliness and actually get a party in the future that has a coherent ideology that is very different from the democratic ideology, which sometimes mm -hmm. I think has, has gotten a little too close to where they are, in particular on economics. But where, where these foreign policy engagements are concerned, I mean, I think what you are ultimately going to see, and this seems to be almost necessarily true, is the merger of the cynicism, the skepticism, and the exhaustion of everyone else um, with respect to the entanglements in Ukraine and in the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. I just don't know that there is going to be, even amongst people who are very concerned about this, who generally stand with Israel, that they're going to be very excited about being engaged in these conflicts in a protracted way many, many months from now. Um, it's already the case that we've seen a lot of that with respect to Ukraine. I have to imagine that that will be on an accelerated, happening on an accelerated clip um, with respect to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. So if that rusty weather vane is going to be moving, well, it should better move pretty quickly uh, if it's going to have any chance of helping Joe Biden in this race. Hmm. Listen to how bad it is. Uh, they report, again, this is the same Washington Post report, that on October 7th, the date of the massacre, many in the White House responded viscerally to the brutal nature of the atrocities. The chief of staff emailed staffers expressing empathy with Jewish staffers and those with personal mm. ties to Israel. Many Jewish staffers appreciated the note, but some Arab and Muslim officials felt it was tone deaf to their concerns. This is the day of the massacre, given wow. that Israeli officials were vowing to carry out a scorched earth campaign in Gaza. <laughs> so you've got Muslim and Arab officials inside the White House pissed off that a note of empathy went out from the chief of staff as the Jews were being beheaded murdered, raped in Israel that day. Muslim appointees in the administration began raising alarm bells about this email uh, and, and what they believed was one-sided rhetoric by the administration, according to a senior administration official familiar with it. They go on to say that the chief of staff and Anita Dunn, who runs strategy for Biden, have conducted regular meetings and listening sessions with the staffers. This in particular, after this six-year-old Palestinian-American boy was fatally stabbed in Illinois. You guys remember Chief Staff writing in an October 17th email, I wanted to take a moment to acknowledge how difficult it's been for our Palestinian, Arab, and Muslim-American colleagues, and goes on from there. Are, is any business getting done inside the White House? I mean, like, 
The number of meetings, Muslim Americans, Arab Americans, we're sorry, we take it back, we'll do better. We're so sorry, sorry about the email, we'll do better for, on this, more listening sessions. My God, this is the, this is our future based on the mm -hmm. wokeification of America and the influx of all these little snowflake petals, whatever, flower petals, mm -hmm. snowflakes, into <laughs> the administration, the White House, you name it. Uh, now, having their way, there's no grown up to say, Grow up. It's not my job to coddle you. Bye. You did, yeah, you didn't <laughs> think that when you went to a university 10 years ago, 12 years ago, and saw the kind of claptrap that was, was uh, you know, passing as intellectual debate, that that wasn't going to ha have, you know, kind of an inf infectious quality in every, you know, thing that we do, right? And, and particularly people who leave college and want to go into politics. People who leave college these days, they, I mean, you're obviously seeing the logical endpoint of people talking about identity ad infinitum, right? As of this, can you talk to me about this? As of that, what is the right strategy for peace in the Middle East? for supporting our ally in the Middle East, Israel, and doing it in a way that is humane, something like that. If that's the conversation you want to have, number one, you're too junior to have it, so please fuck off. The second <laughs> thing is, if we, if you're going to have that conversation, please don't have it about, well, as of this, I am a, a Muslim American, something very bad happened in Chicago, which it absolutely did, and, and something very bad happened in, in Vermont the other day, too. But mm. I, I don't understand what that has to do with what America should do in response to its oldest ally in the Middle East, its only ally that's a true ally in that sense. And from 1948 on, I mean, this is madness because it's just this same BS talking points about identity pushed into an administration that has made some missteps. And we just talked about one of them but has been generally pretty good. And I want to, to acknowledge they've been generally pretty good. They haven't been perfect, but you know, let's not make the perfect of the, the enemy of the good in a situation like this. Uh, Megan, as a manager of people, I know I don't have to tell you, um, don't listen to your staffers. This is <laughs> yeah. just a mistake. Um, don't, My well, staffers are tough. Yeah. My staffers would don't never do, do this it. shit. They, They've learned. Um, I think they're afraid of you. They've got burn marks on their face. <laughs> they would never come work here if they were otherwise. <laughs> yeah. Uh, there's a weird overlap with the story that we were talking about before in the New York uh, school where we saw a riot and like cops beaten and an, uh, a, a teacher barricaded inside of her door. Uh, just an anti-Semitic riot. Uh, an anti-Semitic riot. Yeah. Um, and the apology for the, uh, the chancellor, David Banks, said, well, you have to understand that these kids see uh, uh, videos on TikTok of Palestinian um, uh, babies getting blown up. And so they therefore um, interpret standing with Israel or saying that you stand with Israel as being in favor of that, which is an interesting bit of apologia. And it, it, it suggests the next step, which is tell them, oh, you're really stupid. Knock yeah. it off. Yeah. That's a stupid way to respond. Um, like just even cognitively, let alone like I'm going to act on this stupid response by doing a huge riot on the third floor and to chase a Jewish teacher um, with anti-Semitic remarks and make her scared uh, and barricaded in the classroom. You don't like you don't humor that. Actually, Could you imagine you it. a racist event in which they weren't chasing a Jew through the hall. I mean, it's absolutely appalling that this is real. Or us. Saying, saying <laughs> like anti-Semitic things as the person has to barricade themselves. Good Lord, we had endless conversations about things that were one one hundredth of that, whether it's, you know, the Covington Catholic kid looking rather kind of blasé about the somebody. Ten-year-old in a chair. His, yeah, his, his, his grave crime was smiling. Smiling, smiling in the face right? of a Native American man who was beating a drum in his Jewish face. Jewish yeah. through the school in New York City is not something that you should ever make excuses for. And I suspect if there was a bunch of lacrosse playing white kids in Greenwich, Connecticut, that chased <laughs> the one black teacher because they were mad about something that they stupidly associated with all black people, which Death is penalty. what you're supposed <laughs> yeah. to do in anti-racist, real anti-racist education, <laughs> is not to yeah. blame an entire group for the actions of somebody or something that's similar or that you don't like. I mean, this is utter fucking madness. The response yeah. to be like, well, we have to talk to them. You think that these, 
kids running through attacking a teacher need a talking to? You think that's going to solve share it? Share their words, Michael. Oh my God! I let me talk and, to them. I'll pepper spray. And it's not just it's not just the school. So, there, did you guys see this? The um, the home of the leader of APAC, uh, you know, this yeah, pro-Israel yeah. group, uh, popular with conservatives, yeah. got targeted uh, out in LA. And we've got some video from it and a soundbite of what happened there as these pro-Palestinian protesters stormed the guy's neighborhood, his house, and he got out of there. But the people around him, his neighbors had to come out. Like, it was quite a to-do. Take a look, look at SOT 11. Oh. What's that smoke? A smoke bomb. Oh. Yeah, smoke bombs. Yeah. Papa! Papa, please don't do that! Papa! Get him. So I believe the girl saying, Papa, please don't do that, is the daughter mm -hmm. of the neighbor who was like, F this shit, I'm going out there and talking to these losers. Tell them to get out of yeah. here. So the neighbors stood up for the guy who was under attack. Some of the neighbors actually spoke out to NBC Los Angeles. Here's some of it in SOT 12. When I realized that they were uh, attacking the property, the private property of my uh, neighbor, I decided to, uh, to, uh, mm -hmm. to go and try to stop them. I believe in the First Amendment, but uh, when you pass and you go through a private property and you terrorize people, uh, that's the end for me. When he told me she knew where I live now, so I'm a little bit. We have police coming by constantly. I I think we're safe. Well, I mean, imagine, to your point. <laughs> yeah. Imagine if this were, and, and by the way, we'll show you the video here, fake blood, fake bodies on the driveway, some sign with F your holiday, you baby killer. Uh, this this oh. is like, this, this is what this man had to deal with outside of his home, thanks to this group pro protesting on behalf of the Palestinians, Hamas, you tell me. And um, imagine, to your point, if this were uh, Patrice Cullors at the height of the Black Lives mm -hmm. Matter movement, and this was a bunch of MAGA hat wearing people outside of her home, throwing smoke bombs, F you, you killer, and mock-ups of dead bodies covered in blood all over. The pol it would be an a national story be leading the news. You, most people probably haven't even heard this happened. Yeah. yeah I remember that most, these people do not think that the means are the problem. That's what they pretend to think, or to pretend to, to believe. And they, they, they tell you that, but that's total BS. I mean, they do believe any means necessary and you will have a very muted response from the media because they agree with the goal. The means aren't a problem when you agree with the goal. For me, the means are always a problem. That sort of stuff is unacceptable regardless of what your message is. I agree with you. I don't, this is totally unacceptable if I agree with your message. And I would be ashamed if I was on that side, as it were, and people representing this side that I believed in were gluing themselves to things, screwing up traffic, throwing fake blood on private homes. This is, you know, one of many, many things that we've seen recently. Because, you know, and also never uh, be on the side of any cause that has a hey, hey, ho, ho chant. Yeah, just it's, that always chance going to be bad. it's always it's true. going to be bad. Where is That's this a little happening? known rule. This yeah, it's a little wrong rule, but it's true. This yeah. is happening in Los Angeles. In Brentwood. God knows it's happening in New York uh, constantly. Yeah. Um, it's happening in Washington, D.C. It's happening in Chicago. Um, big cities, big, you know, overwhelmingly dominant progressive, left progressive uh, cities. Um, where is the support for Israel super rock solid the rest of the country? And in fact, in, mm -hmm. in these cities as well, if you like pull the actual majority of people who are not trying to block the Manhattan Bridge when I'm trying to cross over it. Um, so uh, it's an interesting dynamic because where is the idiotic Democratic Party holding its national convention next August in Chicago. Uh, so it's going to be an great advertisement. History it's great history <laughs> there of Democratic conventions. Ooh. It's going to be an advertisement for all this kind of off-putting dysfunction. I mean, this stuff, to the extent of which any a halfway normal person interacts with 
an idiot getting pepper sprayed by Michael Moynihan on the Macy's Day Parade, they are going to hate everything associated with that person yeah. for inconveniencing them. Uh, imagine the rest of the country. If this is going to be the way the Democrats are kind of self-identifying, presenting themselves to the world, it's going to make a doddering incumbent president all the less popular. And it's just remarkable pursuant to uh, everything we've talked about today, it seems like the only person who could possibly lose to Joe Biden is Donald Trump and vice versa. And like, congratulations, America. Well, you know, it's it because we've talked, you know, the four of us many times about what a cancer wokeism is and all this dividing us between each other based on race, et cetera. And the, the, the group we've been looking for to join in these protestations are Classical liberals are sort of the old left too, right? It's like the old left and not these woke progressives who are on the new left, who are annoying and the ones who have taken over the college campuses and portions of the White House. And they started to get it, I think, a bit uh, over the past year plus. I mean, I've talked many times about my friends in New York, most of whom are Democrats, who got a little red-pilled or in some cases entirely red-pilled during COVID. Uh, but more and more, this particular co uh, conflict is bringing it out. And now even some on the left are noticing it and writing about it. I thought this was an interesting Twitter thread by Nate Silver, uh, the pollster who, who came out on 1126 and wrote, I guess this is obvious, but some of the subtext behind the divide between left slash progressives and liberal slash centrists over Israel is that these teams were already rolling their eyes at one another over wokeness slash cancel culture and COVID, mm -hmm. so there's a lot of built up animosity. And he goes on to say, there's more correlation than there probably should be on these issues. Like I'd guess pro-Palestine pro -Palestine folks score quite a bit higher on COVID hawkishness, even though you really have to stretch to come up with a theory for why these positions should be related. It's mm -hmm. fascinating, Camille, he's not wrong, right? I bet mm -hmm. he's right on that correlation, but I love seeing somebody like Nate Silver start to get it that the, that the people who are, in his words, liberal slash centrists have really been on our side all the time on wokeness. And it's their lunatic fringe who needs to be brought to heel for the preservation of the country. Yeah, it's there's something about the derangement um, that occurred during that summer of 2020 when we were seeing all of the insane political violence, uh, the constant, persistent dis disruptions of your life while you're sitting on a sidewalk trying to get something to eat and someone comes and starts screaming in your face, insisting that you agree with them on whatever radical proposition they were suggesting, like abolishing the police, for example. Um, people made apologies for that. All sorts of euphemisms were invented, like mostly peaceful to describe what were obviously odious demonstrations that had way too much violence. <laughs> for you to say mostly peaceful suggests that there's probably something wrong there um, that's happening below the surface. Um, and I don't know how they managed to still win an election after that, having defended those same people. But again, maybe fielding a bad candidate is part of it. Um, but it'll be interesting to see if we, we see a crazy. repeat of that. If these demonstrations continue in this way um, and continue to alienate people, which I think is genuinely true, um, it'll be interesting to see if they can manage to pull this out again. Um, that suggests that this, this weird financial situation the RNC finds themselves in, it, it would probably make sense for them to go bankrupt because they would have no reason to continue to exist if they can consistent, consistently lose to people who engage in this kind of preposterous, disruptive behavior. The, the sclerosis that you were describing earlier in that post about the Biden administration doing these listening tours internally. I mean, imagine that you're elected president of the United States and you're supposed to be designing the policy and crafting it and your staff is out there executing for you. Instead, they are managing an internal insurrection, a, a, a massive schism between the people within the administration just to find a way for them to navigate through this 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 situation that they find themselves in um it is it's hideous in so on so many levels but it's not at all obvious that this is going to be enough to disrupt them because of just how dysfunctional our politics are right now it, you know it, it, watching the right self immolate after Trump with the never Trumpers and the MAGA people and mm -hmm. people saying, you know, Fox isn't conservative enough and I'm only going to watch Newsmax, et cetera. I've had a million of these conversations. 
really made liberals happy. And I, a lot of people that I talked to there, they were like, it's so fun to watch you guys shooting within, you know, inside the tent and having everybody um, have to kind of stake out their position to, to if they're a real conservative. Watching this on the left now when it comes to Israel is really fascinating too. Because as you said, Megan, it's, you know, there's classical liberal types, but there's also liberal liberal types, um, mm -hmm. you know, people that are actually on the left. I mean, you had Maurice Isserman, one of the founders of the DSA, writing in the Nation magazine, a pretty mm -hmm. radical place, saying, I'm leaving the DSA over Israel. Um, John Judas, who I mentioned before, was a, an original guy in DSA, and he was horrified by a lot of this response to Israel because the difference is very, very simple. The past and these cleavages about Israel have existed, right? I mean, Israel, Israel is kind of founded as a left-wing country. Labor Zionism, the kibbutzim are like, it's a form of like labor uh, collectivism. It's a socialist kind of place. Matt and I were at one of the, uh, the kibbutzes that was attacked last year. And it was hilarious to listen to these people. It's like, I'm at, you know, a Marxist training camp in the middle of Israel. <laughs> but it's, it's funny how that happens. But I think the real difference now is it used to be labor Zionism. It used to be kind of like, well, the way that they're handling post-1967 after the Six-Day War and the occupation of, at that point, Gaza and the West Bank is wrong. And we're like Betzalem, this kind of left-wing organization in Israel. Haaretz, a left-wing newspaper. The thing that these people in Israel can't understand. Now, look this up. I, I, I uh, tell li listeners to go and look this up. The Israeli left has been writing these open letters to their friends on the American left. Artists, there's a big one amongst Israeli artists saying, you know, hey, we're left-wing too, but what the hell is wrong with you guys? Because it's become <laughs> from the river to the sea. It's become, you know, this kind of exterminationist ideology, and I mean extermination for the state of Israel, that it shouldn't exist. The number of people I've asked at these protests, do you think Israel should exist? No, where do they go? Back to where they came from. I literally had that, somebody say that to me, and I was like, Poland, uh, Germany, France, Iraq, uh, uh, well, Iraq, who had a huge Jewish population in Baghdad, and now has four Jews left. And that's actually true. I think there are four Jews in Baghdad. But it is it is a wild thing that the transformation has not been that the left has always been this way. The transformation is within the left of people who went from a kind of left wing vision of what Israel should be to the default position on the left, the actual left, not the sort of liberal kind of Democrat, that Israel is a problem for even existing. And if mm -hmm. we could go back to 1948 and eliminate the only Jewish state, which was a refuge from people who survived the Holocaust, they would pull that rug out from under them. That's not what the Just old Just to bring left, it full uh, circle, um, Charles Koch, the, he describes himself as a classical liberal, which is not the same as a, quote, just liberal. Uh, classical liberals are much more focused on just getting the government out of our business kind of like you guys, libertarians, and uh, don't really want a lot of social engineering and don't want a lot of taxes. And that's Charles Koch too, and, and believes in the free market, doesn't want a lot of mm -hmm. intervention on, you know, quote, fair trade as opposed to free trade. And then liberals are the people we all grew up surrounded by. I mean, like liberals, they used to be, you know, pro-choice and pro-gay marriage and pro-protecting the environment, but they weren't insane. They weren't trying to divide us by skin color and pretending men can be women and saying the earth is going to be over in two years unless we uh, stop eating cows. I mean, it's maybe some of them did, but that, that's a, a little radical for them too. And I do think there's still some normie liberals out there who listen to this show. I think I have a fair amount of these people who listen to us. We're tolerable to them. And they are looking for a place to land. They're politically homeless because like Nate Silver is saying, they see nothing. They have nothing in common with these woke leftist progressives who are now getting a seat at the table inside the White House. All right, I take a quick break. When we come back, I've been dying to get you guys to react. I know this is a, a week old now, but I really wanted to get you to react to what happened in San Francisco with these CEOs uh, uh, giving a standing O to President Xi. And we have a little background on some of these CEOs for you that you might find interesting. So stand by for that. Finding an honest doctor that is not following in the footsteps of Big Pharma can feel impossible. That's why millions of men and women have turned to one Texas doctor and the seven reasons he says anyone over the age of 50 should be drinking this one thing. It's not milk or another calcium rich drink. Instead, it is a unique protein that naturally declines with age 
and can significantly increase bone strength and soothe joint pain. He says it can minimize wrinkles and cellulite, enhance hair follicle thickness, and can even reverse nail damage, with users reporting results in as little as two weeks. This Texas doctor is offering Megyn Kelly viewers up to 45% off his bone, joint, and ligament restoring formula at nativepath.sale/mk. It has thousands of five-star reviews and over 4 million jars sold. Every order comes with a 365-day money-back guarantee, so there's no risk to try it today. Megan Kelly viewers can visit nativepath.sale/mk to get up to 45% off while supplies last. Negative dings on credit reports happen to all sorts of people from all socioeconomic backgrounds. Understanding the credit landscape can be extremely difficult. <laughs> Very difficult and unpleasant. Spending the time to dispute and repair these so-called dings can be a full-time job too. Good luck to you if you already have one of those or kids or anything else going on. For starters, you're gonna have to deal with three, the three separate credit bureaus, and that in and of itself is a massive headache. It's also a common misconception that people with poor credit scores are just those who simply don't pay their bills. These can be very hardworking people who are negatively affected by divorce, identity theft, medical debt, student loans. I've been there, that happened to me, uh, and don't have the time or are too overwhelmed to fix it. But if you do not address negative credit items, they can haunt you for years to come and when it counts the most, like when you're trying to get a mortgage at a competitive rate. Well, the good news is that our sponsor, Lexington Law, wants to help you. Go to lexingtonlaw.com, start today with a free consultation and review, and tell them Megan sent you at lexingtonlaw.com. Guys, I'm sure you saw this. Uh, our, our American company leaders went out to San Francisco when President Xi Jinping from China was here and gave him a standing ovation. They looked like good little communists as they stood <laughs> and clapped for the man, now committing a genocide against Muslims in China. Watch this. Oh my God, didn't Anyone stop to think to themselves, not a good look, not a good look. You know, the forced sterilization of Muslims in China. I'm really not going to stand and applaud the guy who's doing that. Um, but among others, we had Tim Cook of Apple, Pfizer CEO, FedEx CEO, Salesforce CEO. And then there was the BlackRock CEO. Now, all of these corporate leaders, all of them were very vocal after George Floyd about what a racist country America is how disgusting America is because of our inherent racism, including, of course, most especially the BlackRock CEO, Larry Fink, who he, he sent out a message, the murders of Ahmaud Arbery and George Floyd, ready for it? And the incident in Central Park. Hello, Camille. Camille Foster is the one who broke the real, the true story of Central Park, Karen, which is not a nice name, but that's how people know her. Uh, show how much work we have to do to build a stronger, more equal and safer society. These events are symptoms of a deep and long-standing problem in our society and must be addressed on both a personal and systemic level. We're the problem. That guy, he was in the middle doing this. For the guy committing the genocide of Muslims, these CEOs are disgusting hypocrites. I never want to hear their lectures about the United States again. Yes. <laughs> yeah, yes. Yeah. Everyone can just say yes to that. Camille, yeah. were you in the room there? I, I was not out there. I was yeah, not in the room. There. I was you not in the room. Clapping I, for the Maoists. I certainly had my my commute disrupted. I was not there. I wouldn't have been standing and applauding. I, I find it. I mean, there's so many reasons to dislike um, Chi. Uh, but for these people in particular, I mean, they've been moaning about the fact that the Chinese have been breaking into their companies, stealing their trade yeah, secrets, right. st ripping off their technology for months and months. It was just this past um, October that the Five Eyes were getting together. And the sole thing that they were talking about publicly was Chinese misconduct in the the, the kind of corporate espionage that's taking place, this theft um, that is happening at an unmitigated pace. And it is amazing to see these technology companies that have in many instances been directly affected by this stuff still having 
to applaud for this man in that context because they're so worried about their own bottom line, that that particular lucrative market in China, which they all hope to get a piece of. Um, but imagine doing that. Imagine building Ugh. factories and investing with the expectation that that this is going to work out well for you. It probably won't in the long run. So it is interesting the, cor the way corporate courage works, where you can speak out boldly <laughs> on social issues domestically when it's completely safe for you. But when there's actual some actually some risk associated with it um, and when there are some real stakes, it's un unquestionable, unquestionably, um, you're unwilling to say anything. You stand it, and you applaud. It's not even a one-way street. People tend to think, oh, they don't want to lose out on their market share. And I don't, I think it was Milton Friedman who said the greatest enemy of capitalism are capitalists because they want to disrupt markets for their own benefit. But sure. I would say, I would say this, that, that the Chinese actually need these companies too. Mm -hmm. it's, not as, it's not as if you don't have any leverage in these matters. And, you know, we mm. talk endlessly and these corporate CEOs talk endlessly about, as you point out, Megan, historic racism of the United States. It, it is a single party rule in China. And that is this very same party who gave us uh, the great leap forward in the Cultural Revolution, mm -hmm. where over 100 million people died. Um, so if you want to look at a country's horrible past, not even their present, which is incredibly horrible too, and to say that, well, you know, this is fine. There have been a number of books that came out. I'm actually reading one right now. So it actually, this is why I'm bringing this up, um, about why Hollywood. Why are you reading? In, I'm, re I'm reading a book by a really interesting historian named Thomas Doherty, and it's called Hitler in Hollywood. And it's about how all the studios um, basically had, to, I mean, they're all owned and run by by Jewish uh, guys like the Warners and the mayors, Louis B. Mayer, et cetera. But they had to compromise in, in certain ways because uh, Germany was a big market. And like they wanted to sell their films in Germany. And right. there was big uh, debate about whether we should do films that even attack Adolf Hitler. So this is like an old problem, but we see that and we look back on it and say, oh my God, what's come mm -hmm. back? But right in our midst, you have all of these CEOs clapping like demented seals in California. Um, I, for I, the, for the I'm going to tell year. you right now, I don't care what event I'm at. Yes, yeah, sit down. I, I could never, would never be on my feet cheering for that man. It's an absurdity. They embarrass themselves and their companies and their country. Um, I just want to point out for the record, however, I am not reading anything quite that highbrow, but I am enjoying my current book, which is the uh, autobiography of Barbara Streisand. Oh, oh, wow. Okay. She reads it herself. I'm listening to the audio. And I, like, it's one of those situations, guys, where, you know, I know that her politics and mine are very, very different. She yeah, says she she's going to leave the country if Trump gets reelected, <laughs> all that stuff, right? But she's so, I don't care. I, I admire her yes. and I respect what she's achieved. And um, she's one of those people. She's got like the EGOT, you know, the Emmy, the Grammy, the mm -hmm. Oscar, and the Tony. the Tony. And just her life. Do you know that for most of her childhood, she had no idea she could sing? She just wanted to be an actress, that's all. And it wasn't until sort of late into her teens that she realized, oh, people seem to enjoy my singing. Maybe I could do some of that. Anyway, it's fascinating so far. And I like the way she reads it too. All sorts of interesting stories about people like Dustin Hoffman and Warren Beatty and Marlon Brando. Anyway, that's my recommendation, guys. A pleasure. See you over on Substack. And thanks to all of you for listening. I'll be back on Thursday, day off tomorrow.